I've been asked to highlight facts and information relating to Hinduism so that those of other religions can gain some new insight in Hinduism. Okay, I'm excited to get into it. Let's get started. And number 10, here we have one God. Now, this comes as a surprise to many who follow a particular monotheistic religion, but Hindus all believe in one supreme God who created the entire universe. He or she is everywhere. He or she created also many other gods, which are advanced spiritual beings to be helpers. So not the supreme God, but other lowercase g gods. Hindus all worship one supreme being but use different names and this is because the people of India with different languages and cultures they have understood God in their own distinct way. So one of the concepts in Hinduism is that God is not far away but is inside each and every single person, in every heart, in consciousness and God is just waiting to be discovered. Number nine, let's look at cow worship. So to Hindus, the cow symbolizes all other creatures. The cow is a symbol of the earth. The cow is a nourisher and it's just a very generous giver. The cow represents life and sustenance on this planet and you'll notice that at festivals some Hindus may decorate and honor cows but they do not worship cows in the sense that they worship the creator. According to the Rig Veda 428.1-6 it says the cows have come and have brought us good fortune. In our stalls contended may they stay. May they bring forth calves for us many colored giving milk for Indra each day. You make O cow Cows, the thin man sleek. To the unlovely, you bring beauty. Rejoice our homestead with pleasant lowing. In our assemblies, we laud your vigor. Number eight brings us to karma. Karma is actually a natural law of the mind, similar to gravity is a natural law. So just as God created gravity to hold some order to the physical world, he also created karma as a divine law and this law helps to govern justice and injustice to make life fair. Karma automatically creates the appropriate future experience in response to current actions. Karma simply means action or cause and effect. And when something happens to us, for example, that apparently is bad or unjust, Hindus view it not as God punishing us, but it's actually a result of a past action. Next up, reincarnation. Carnate means of the flesh and reincarnation means to, well, re-enter the flesh. And this is something that Hindus believe in. Life and death are realities for everyone and Hinduism teaches that the soul never dies, but it actually inhabits one body again and again. It's comparable to a caterpillar's transformation into a butterfly. So like physical death is the natural transition for the soul as it continues its journey until it becomes one with God. And that's when it inhabits a new body over and over and over again. Yoga is at number six. The original meaning of yoga pretty much translates as oneness or union with God. And the term yoga, however, refers to a wide range of Hindu practices. So it's really important to specify what type of yoga you're referring to when you say yoga. In modern usage though, yoga typically refers to hatha yoga. And this is where you perform yoga postures or asanas, which are based on Hindu scriptures. Hatha yoga is performed by Hindus to prepare for meditation but you see today especially in the westernized versions of yoga health benefits have become a primary focus rather than the spiritual benefits of yoga so hatha yoga is just one aspect of a practice known as astanga yoga which has eight stages and asta means eight by the way and anga means limb all right guys halfway through this episode at number five other religions. Let's talk about this. So Hindus are to honor all religions and people. In reference to other religions, Hindu leaders often quote a verse from the Rig Veda, and that's number 1, 164, 46, and it says, truth is one, sages describe it variously. This, by the way, describes the idea that there can be multiple valid viewpoints about the Supreme God and the Supreme Reality. As a matter of fact, Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan 
who is a philosopher and a former president of India, he stated this, and I quote, the Hindu recognizes one supreme spirit, though different names are given to it. Let's talk about meat eating up next. Hindus teach vegetarianism as a way to live with less harm being inflicted to other beings, but not all Hindus are vegetarian. This can be a very, very, very sensitive topic to discuss since there is no strict commandment about this. Rather, you'll find some counsel in Hindu sources about how to treat living beings. Like in the Yajur Vidas 3618, it advises people to show kindness towards all other living creatures. Idol worship. Let's talk about this real quick. Hindus do not worship statues and objects as God. They rather worship God through the particular images. To explain this icon worship as it's called, it's important to note that Hindus believe God is everywhere in all things, whether it's a rock or animal or people. And a Hindu can see God in rocks or water or fire or the air or even inside their own soul. All religions have symbols of holiness that help connect them to the divine. For example, Christians have the cross or statues of Mary. Muslims have the Kaaba in Mecca and Jews had the Ark of the Covenant. So these things do not take the place of the one God. Rather, they are symbols that help one connect to God according to their various religious beliefs. While we're on the topic of God, we have to look at God marriage. Commonly in Hinduism, God is represented as a male and God's energy or Shakti is personalized and represented as its female spouse, like in the case of Vishnu and Lakshmi. And in Hindu art and mythology, you'll see that God is depicted as this divine couple. And when it comes to the philosophy behind this, God and God's energy are actually one. They're inseparable. And the metaphor of being a divine couple is simply just to illustrate this oneness. Here's God and God's energy, completely inseparable, always together. And finally, let's end off this episode looking at the caste system. This can be a very touchy topic too, but the caste system is the inherited division of Indian society based on occupation. Now that in itself is not a bad thing. Similar to the blue collar or the physical laborer or the white collar, which is the office worker or similar classifications used in the United States. But one thing to know is that it is illegal in India to discriminate against, abuse or insult anyone on the basis of caste. Yet still, many are discriminated for the color of your skin, as well as your income level and social status. And the mistreatment of people is actually not a Hindu teaching. And more and more and more Hindus are despising this caste abuse and are taking actions to end it. Now, there are four major traditions when it comes to studying Hinduism, and they are as follows. There's the Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism, and Smartism. Now, these Hindu denominations are traditions with within Hinduism that center on one or more gods or goddesses. So they're sometimes referred to as denominations of Hinduism. And the terms denominations or traditions are often used interchangeably, so they pretty much mean the same thing. Now, these different denominations, they differ primarily in their focus of what deity is at the center of the tradition. So when we look at Vaishnavism, Vaishnavism is also called Vishnuism, and it's distinct because followers pay devotion devotion to Vishnu and his incarnations or avatars. The followers of this tradition are called Vaishnavas. For Vaishnavas, there is absolute reality or Brahman is manifested in Vishnu, who in turn is incarnated in Rama, Krishna, and many other avatars. And when we break this down, we see that it is polymorphic monotheism, which means that it's a theology that recognizes many forms of one single divinity, since there are many forms of one original deity. Through this, we have avatars. Through his avatars, the tradition states that Vishnu defends traditional righteousness in keeping the moral law, which is called Dharma. And among other popular names used for the supreme being are Rama, 
Krishna, Narayana, Kalki, Hari, Vithoba, Kesava, Madhava, Govinda, Sri Natji, and Jagannath. Fashionism originated between the late centuries BCE and the early centuries CE, and it's really the mixture of the heroic Krishna Vasudeva, the divine child. And also mixed in there are Bala Krishna of Gopala traditions. Fashionism comprises of many different sects and smaller groups that differ in their interpretation of their relationship between someone and the higher power or God. Then there is Shaivism. So in Shaivism, Shiva is seen as the supreme being, and the followers of Shaivism are called Shaivites or Saivites. Some trace the origins of this back to the Indus Valley civilization, which reached its peak around 2500 to 2000 BCE. Revering Shiva like this can be found all across India, as well as Sri Lanka and Nepal. Now, reverence to Shiva is very popular. It could have something to do with what the word Shiva actually means. And Shiva literally means kind, friendly, gracious, or auspicious. And when you use it as a proper name, Shiva means the auspicious one. And a name like that denotes success for people. So I don't know, who knows? Shaivism has many different sub-traditions as well, and there's different variations of them just depending on the region that you're in, you're gonna notice some differences there. There's a lot of literature also relating to Shaivism because I mentioned it is so popular, and there's also several different schools of thought. One of the other major branches is Shaktism. So Shaktism is a worship of the Hindu goddess Shakti, whose name means power or energy. The full form of the goddess's name is Adi Parashakti, and it's very popular in the states of West Bengal and Assam in India. In this tradition, the metaphysical reality is considered to be feminine as a metaphor. And then when we examine the Sruti and Smriti texts in Hinduism, we'll notice that they're very important to the framework of Shaktism and its entire tradition. Yogis regard Shakti as the power that lies dormant within the body as a coiled serpent. You may have heard the term Kundalini. So that's what that energy refers to, the coiled serpent, the Kundalini power. And followers of Shaktism believe that this must be aroused and awakened in order to realize spiritual liberation and freedom. On top of that, Shaktism is an important part of Hindu Tantra, the whole system of practices and everything. This is really designed to empower people so that they can just be free in their mind, and their body. Now the final tradition that I want to look at in Hinduism is Smartism. Now Smartism is a bit different from other Hindu traditions because it's not just specifically about one god. It doesn't revolve around one god or goddess. Smartis is what you call those who follow Smartism. They may worship any god that they choose, but the most common of these gods are Shiva, Ganesha, Vishnu, Surya, Skanda, and Shakti as well. They're also open to worship any of the avatars of of these gods. Now the Smarta tradition developed during the classical period around the beginning of the common era. And the term Smarta also refers to Brahmins who specialize in the Smarta corpus text named the Griya Sutras. And when we look at the etymology of this word, the meaning of the term Smarta relates to memory or something that's recorded. So those are the four main branches of Hinduism, all of which have other sub-branches with different variations based on the region and also the cultural practices. Now there are also many minor branches of Hinduism. Some of the main minor traditions are Shratism. Now they put a lot of importance on the performance of a Vedic sacrifice called Yajna where they place various types of offerings into a fire. Then there is Suryism or Sarism and this is a worship of Surya as the main form of Saguna Brahman which means the absolute with qualities. There's also Ganapatism where Lord Ganesha is worshipped as the main form of Saguna Brahman. Kamaram is another one that's found in South India as well as Sri Lanka and in this tradition Lord Muruga Kurtikeya is the supreme god. Then there's also Indonesian Hinduism where the followers consider Asintya as the supreme god as well as they view all other gods as his different manifestations. I also found some other newer forms 
of Hinduism, and those are Ananda Marga, Arya Samaj, Ayavadzi, Brahmoism, Prathana Samaj, Ramakrishna Mission, Sri Narayana Dharma Paripalana. Yeah, try saying that three times fast. There's also the Swadhyay Paravar movement and the Satya Sai organization. Now, with these different traditions, it's very common that you're going to find Hindus revering Shiva, Vishnu, and Shakti, as well as celebrating festivals that relate to them in different times of the year. Many Hindu temples also feature multiple gods in there, so you're gonna find a lot of overlap in the Hinduism traditions. But with the freedom that Hinduism really brings, there's not much division in terms of what is the actual right belief in Hinduism because it's so liberating and so free and open in terms of what you can believe in the religion. That's why many people don't want to call it a religion. They just say Hinduism is their way of life. Hey, listen, if this attribute connects with you, you're free to believe in that. If Shakti and female energy speaks to you, well, you're free to revere that as well. All still seen as different manifestations and qualities of the supreme being, God. The word Hindu is derived from the Sanskrit word Sindhu, meaning river. It was the Arabic invaders that used the name Hindu for people that were on the other side of the river, Indus. Now here's a surprising one. Did you know that Hinduism is not the real name for the religion? This name was made up by Greeks and Arabs to those living by the Sindhu River. The real name of Hinduism is Sanatana Dharma or the Vedic Dharma. Sanatana Dharma means the eternal way and that's pretty much the easiest way that I can translate it into English because there's no single English word translation for Dharma. Hinduism also has no founder according to scholars. They state that Hinduism has various cultural and traditional roots and it has evolved over time through different texts and scriptures. And speaking of religious texts, yes, Hinduism is made up of several scriptures, sacrificial formulas as well as songs. This group of texts are known as Vedas. Vedas are also called Surti, unlike other religious texts which are called Smirti, meaning what is remembered. Now before I continue with this video guys, that leads us to our question of this episode and I want to know what religious books have you read? Whether it's the Bible, the Kojiki, the Quran or anything else, let me know down there. In Hinduism, the Rig Veda is the first sacred text of Hindus. It was written more than 3,800 years ago, and the text of it was written for over 3,500 years. The text had been passed down orally from generation to generation, and many of its verses continue to be used today in many Hindu celebrations, making it probably the world's oldest religious text currently still in use. Hindus consider the number 108 to be very sacred. Although there are some variations on the number significance, this is in relation to the sun's distance from the earth and the sun's diameter or the moon's distance from the earth and the moon's diameter. It gets pretty tricky and complex, but we also see significance of the number 108 because most of the prayer beads in Hinduism contain 108 beads. Many of the deities in the Hindu religion, like Lord Shiva for example, have a specific day that they're worshipped on. Like Lord Shiva is worshipped on Monday. However, Hindus themselves don't have a specific day to actually go to their temple and worship. The temple can simply be visited anytime they feel. Now this word here, juggernaut, the official definition for it is a huge, powerful, and overwhelming force or institution. Also, if you are a fan of X-Man like myself, it also refers to this guy right here. But anyways, the English word juggernaut is taken from the Jagannath chariot. This was a huge chariot of the Jagannath temple which reportedly crushed hundreds of people under its wheels during a Rath Yatra, which is simply a chariot festival. Now most of us have heard this sound. Um, I think I did it right. Well that word spelt A-U-M or simply O-M. It's considered to be a very holy sound. The beginning sound, ah, that represents the creation aspect of the universe and everything within it. The oo sound signifies the maintaining energy in the universe, as well as the subtle impressions of the mind. 
and the mmm sound, that characterizes the transformative energy of the universe and the thoughts and beliefs of your beingness. Another pretty interesting thing about Hinduism is that atheists and believers in a god can actually exist together. This is because Hinduism gives complete freedom of practice, and they advocate that there are many ways to reach God, although the path may be different. Perhaps one of the most well-known Hindu sayings is this, the truth is one, sages call it by different names. In the end, this is what Hinduism aims to teach you. Loka Samatha Sukino Bhavantu Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. And that translates to, may all the beings in all the worlds be happy. Let there be peace, peace, and peace everywhere. Now the term Dharma, which means righteousness, Artha, which means money, Kama, that means the right desire, and Moksha, meaning salvation, make up the four main life goals of Hinduism. The goal of life in Hinduism is to attain salvation, or Moksha. Self-realization and freedom from the cycle of death and rebirth is the final goal. In Hinduism, there's also the belief in a circular concept of life rather than a linear concept of life. Time is divided into four ages. The Satya Yuga, the golden age of innocence, Tretha Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. In Hindu cosmology, it's believed that their universe is created and destroyed in a cycle of every 4.32 billion years. Quite interestingly enough, that also does coincide with many scientists and in their beliefs of the date of this earth. Although that is way in the realm of speculation, it was just interesting to note the two similarities here. Okay, so let's move on to the major books of Hinduism. We have the Vedas, Ramayana, Bhagavad Gita, 18 Puranas, and the Mahabharata. Now, the Vedas are the central book in Hinduism. Lord Brahma is credited with the composition of the Vedas, which were passed down from the great sages to their disciples. There are four Vedas, the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. The Mahabharata, one of the major religious texts in Hinduism, is also the longest epic poem in the world and is also described as the longest poem ever written. The longest version of the Mahabharata consists of over 10,000 shlokas or 200,000 individual verse lines. About 1.8 million words in total, the Mahabharata is roughly 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Now, as you know, in our world today, gender equality is a huge topic. So let's talk a little bit about gender equality in Hinduism. Well, in terms of gender equality with their gods, Hinduism is perhaps the only religion which boasts of an almost equal number of male and female deities. And in Hinduism, deities of both gender are worshipped with equal passion. Also, Hinduism is one of the few religions that does not consider the pursuit of wealth a sin. And if you guys are familiar with Hinduism, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, both material and spiritual, is a testament to that fact in Hinduism. Now guys, did you know that Hinduism promotes organ donation? The first example of organ donation in the world can be found in Hindu mythology. Sage Dadichi, who happily donated his bones so that Lord Indra could use them to create a weapon, the Vajra, to kill demons. For those of you who also may be familiar with plant-based treatments, Ayurveda, the plant-based medical treatment practice, has its roots from Hinduism. The largest Hindu temple in the world is surprisingly not in India. Really? So where is it? It's actually located in Angkor, Cambodia. Hinduism has spread across many countries over the years, especially in Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Malaysia, Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand, and other Southeast Asian countries. The people following Hinduism around the world are approximately 1 billion people, which is about 14% of the world's population. That is a huge chunk of the population. 